Ready or not, the moment of truth is here. Having abundant energy in the future requires critical choices today. And the energy pioneers are turning challenge into opportunity. Liquid gold made right here in this country. From big business, it is in everyone's economic interest. You make money, you improve the environment. To your next door neighbor. We look out at the sea of roofs and we just think, well, there should be a panel on every roof. From China to the U.S. military, some surprising new players are leading the charge. I'm M. Sanjit, and the race to power our future starts now. Suppose you decided to save the world a lot of energy. And you wanted to start with the one part of our lives that burns up more power than any other. Where would you begin? If you said transportation, you'd be wrong. What about industry? Wrong again. No, the lion's share of our energy goes to power buildings. That's where we work, shop, pray, eat, live. Our buildings suck up 41% of America's power. And we're throwing a lot of that power right out the window. One noteworthy example towers above the Manhattan skyline. Built at the height of the Great Depression, the Empire State Building stands as a symbol of our ability to overcome any obstacle. Now, it's taking the lead in a new 21st century challenge. The war against wasted energy. Paul Rohde, part of a growing power efficiency movement, is tackling the job. It's not so much about conservation, but more about using energy the right way to do more. Yeah. Rhodey and other green building engineers act as energy sleuths, hunting down power savings that are all around us. So these streets for you are just uh, lined with opportunity. They are lined with opportunity, absolutely. Yeah. I see clues that signal energy savings. The, the lights on, for instance, in the top floor of that building. Right. That's a clue. The, the ventilation systems in that building, I, I see that there, there are no louvers outside. I, there's probably a better way to move the air inside. So I hear you've got one giant... Rudy's got plenty to do retrofitting the world's most famous office building. Every working day, the Empire State Building burns through enough electricity to power 40,000 American households. And about 40% of that energy is wasted in ways Rhodey says he can fix. His design has got to be good enough to supply the energy demands of 25,000 people a day, moving in and out of the building, needing air conditioning in the summer, heat in the winter, and light all year round. There must be enough power to handle the countless high-tech devices we take for granted, but with the stuff of science fiction when the building went up in 1931. Rhodey reimagines old buildings to meet modern energy demands bringing back the best of what already exists. How high are we? We're on the 41st floor. Okay. About midway right. in, the, in the part of the building. That's like raising the ceilings. Lots of light. Lots there. of light in here. Feet what up. is it, 10 feet up, right? It's, it's over 10 feet up. While adding new technological innovations. Light comes into the space much deeper. Such as programmable cooling and heating systems. Photo cells and occupancy sensors so that things get turned off. Sure. And so it leaves their workstation. All miscellaneous loads at that workstation are shut off. Yeah. Oversized ductwork so that the air flows through the ductwork much slower. Green engineers like Rhodey believe that saving watts of energy is just as important as generating watts. We're taking power off of the building, okay? Instead of supplying the building with more power, we're finding ways to take power off. Rhodey is aiming for savings on a grand scale in the Empire State Building. But he's pointing the way for all of us to add power to the system by not using it. 
energy creation by negation. It's the one action we can all take in our daily lives to contribute to the solution. Turning off a light keeps coal in the ground. Leaving a car at home boosts oil reserves. Taking a shorter shower expands the natural gas supply. Easy and obvious fixes. What conservationists call low-hanging fruit. Apply Rody's more aggressive methods to conserve energy across Manhattan, and the energy savings would power nearly half the households on the island. Retrofit all U.S. commercial buildings, and you could provide electricity to the entire state of New York or the country of France. Empire State Building principal owner Anthony Malkin, a born and bred New York real estate man, is shelling out $20 million for Rody's retrofit. To Malkin, wasted power is wasted money. The three costs of occupancy of an office building are salary, rent, and utilities. And people don't keep track enough of how that utility cost creeps up and over time expands. Right, no, I think people... Malkin's message is simple. Saving energy is good business. It is in everyone's economic interest. You make money, you improve the environment. Doing good and doing well is at the heart of Paul Rohde's appeal to tough-minded landlords. And he sold Anthony Malkin on the deal with a money-back guarantee. If his fixes don't cut the Empire State Building's energy use by more than a third, he'll pay Malkin the difference. When you do all these Courageous? The, um, you bet. But with the Empire State Building, halfway measures won't cut it. A key element in Rody's plan is a campaign to fix one of the most visible and wasteful features on the building, the windows. All 6,500 of them. Of course, when he decided to update every single window on the building, he had a dilemma. He could buy new windows, but that would mean scrapping all the old ones. 425 tons of perfectly good glass, and manufacturing an entirely new set. It takes a lot of energy to make 6,500 windows. Not to mention trucking them all into Manhattan, burning barrels of oil and gas in the process. By the time the job was complete, any energy savings from the new, more efficient windows would be wiped out by the power spent to make and install them. So where are we heading to now? Oh, the window preparation area. So Rudy decided to do something that had never been done before. Fix the existing windows right here in the building. Through here? Thank you, sir. And down this way. Wow. You see where it all comes together. This is very well choreographed, right. much like uh, a, a, you know an, an operation that you would see in the military. These windows were installed less than 15 years ago and are already double pane, which saves energy. But Rody's team is on a mission to take apart every window and make them even more efficient. 50% more. A giant squeeze. And that's exactly what's going on. Right. Glass is being cleaned here. Each window will be cleaned, inspected. Looking for flaws and imperfections in the glass and fitted with a special solar film that lets in light while blocking heat. It's basically this stuff, right? Let's light in, but it doesn't heat up the bill. That's correct. So you're lowering your air conditioning We're lowering our air conditioning bill, and we're also actually lowering our lighting bill because we're using that light to see with. Of course. What's amazing is you're refurbishing the window. That's the point. That is the point. The, the, the greenest building is one that's already built. We want to reuse as many parts and pieces of this building as possible. But will it work for others? Rody and Malkin believe it will, and are making their methods public. 
They're banking on succeeding in one of the world's best-loved buildings and proving to others that good energy policy is good business. It's funny, you know, you're, you're looking at four or five of our buildings over my, my oh. shoulder in, 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 the, in New York City below. And when we first conducted these conversations, I suggested a building down there on between 35th and 36th Street on Broadway. And they said, you know, if we succeed with that, no one will care. We want to do the Empire State Building because if we can impact the Empire State Building, we can grab the attention of the world. If we're going to solve the energy problem, we'll have to pay attention to the risk takers showing us the way. And they're out there if you know where to look. Some are towering above us. Others live right down the street. It's an energy revolution that could be coming soon to a neighborhood near you. The number of choices we face in our daily lives can be absolutely staggering. In these shelves is just jam-packed with stuff all competing for our attention and, of course, our dollars. And the products promoting themselves as good for the environment keep growing in number and variety. Decisions confront us from all sides, boggling our minds. Incandescent or fluorescent, gas or electric, paper or plastic, cage-free or free-range. The constant barrage of choices can paralyze even the savviest and most well-meaning of shoppers. It's no wonder so many simply throw up their arms and give up even trying to make a difference. Most of us don't know anything about the energy we consume. We use it, we pay for it, end the story. But in some communities across America, next-door neighbors are joining forces to tap into the power that is all around us. Last fall, solar panels began appearing on rooftops in the middle-class neighborhood of Mount Pleasant in Washington, D.C. The local power company didn't put them there. People did. It took three years of sweat, persistence, and teamwork by the Mount Pleasant Solar Co-op a volunteer community organization to get the panels in place. Uh, drop it in, it's getting hot. Anya Schoolman is the co-founder of the co-op. She says the idea came from her teenage son. My son Walter and his best friend Diego came back from seeing the movie Inconvenient Truth. And we were sitting around the table with them and Diego's dad Jeff and talking about what could we do, what could we do, and decided really that we should go solar, that that fit our neighborhood, our roofs, and that was the beginning of it. Machine. But Anya, Walters and their friends discovered a daunting set of obstacles stood between them and their solar dream. Too many products to choose from, too much paperwork to fill out, and too much money for contractors and permits and panels. Instead of quitting, we said, okay, if we're going to figure this thing out, we're doing the whole neighborhood, because it's too much work to do it on our own. Around the neighborhood, word spread quickly about the co-op, especially after Walter began a project that brought a steady stream of people to the house. My son Walter did a project with compact fluorescent light bulbs. And what we found is that most people had heard of compact fluorescent light bulbs, but they hadn't really used them, or they had them in one or two light bulbs. And so what Walter did is purchased every light bulb variety we could find in the city, and we tested them. We're trying to replace this light with this kind of light, and one of the things we really like about it is that it's very hard to tell the difference, but this one uses significantly less electricity than this one. We bought $3,000 worth of light bulbs and we filled up this room 
behind me with boxes of light bulbs. And it turned out to be a great organizing technique because people came in in small batches and we really had a time to meet people and get to know people. And the real strength of the co-op came from those relationships. <laughs> Soon the Mount Pleasant Solar Co-op was attracting dozens of people to meetings in Anya's living room. They asked questions, compared notes, and strategized about everything from cutting political red tape to bargaining with solar installers. What really surprised us was how many different kinds of people were really interested in this. And they all knew something about solar. They really thought it was a neat idea of having their own power. Credit for that. And it's really a good part yeah, that's, yeah, that's another thing. And then, of course, people are really motivated by climate change. There are only a few dozen solar co-ops in the United States today, but the number is growing. Private citizens taking matters into their own hands to change the way America gets its power. Co-ops differ in the details. Some charge fees, some don't. Question time. But they all find strength in numbers. Finding the right panels at better prices. Arguing with local utilities for high-tech metering systems. But it's a non-taxable grant. That's the key thing. And pushing politicians for tax breaks to make solar more affordable. Anya and her family were among the first in Mount Pleasant to turn their rooftop into a power plant. After three years of battling the system, installing the panels was a snap. Actually, these were installed in a day. And they're just stuck on. Now, solar panels are sprinkled across the neighborhood rooftops. There's one over there. There's two right there. There's here, here. There's one over there. There's ours, and there's several more in that direction. And there's 47 installations all around just this neighborhood, which is about five blocks this way and about five blocks that way. We look out of this sea of roofs, and we just think, well, there should be a panel on every roof, and every person that lives in D.C. should have the chance to lower their bill by 30 or 50 percent. Why not? The co-op helped Tom Kelly fulfill a decades-long dream to harvest the sun. I, I went solar because, maybe because of a day like this, you know, you, it's, it's obvious as the sun in your face that this is a good, benign, non-invasive, simple technology. I wonder why everybody doesn't do it. Look, it's not making any noise, it's not moving, it's just sitting here giving me electricity. That is so very cool. Now neighbors like Tom Kelly and Rob Robinson compete in producing electricity. Today's total so far is 19.7 kilowatts. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> eat your heart out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Make it hurt. Good Lord. They're going to owe you money this month. I, I'm hoping. Now, when the sun is out and his lights are off, Tom's meter runs backwards. Hours. Yeah, but how fast is your meter? Well, I, I looked at it. I looked at it about an hour ago. It was one three five five. Now it's at one three five three. That means he's selling his home brewed energy to the power company, and his bill is down a whopping eighty percent. I love your monitoring system. <laughs> and everybody likes to beat up on the zoom. As much as they love spinning their electricity bills backwards, co-op members have some higher motives as well. Hooking up solar helps free them from coal, problematic fuel that provides 40% of the electricity in the world. Unrivaled in its power, coal has two major drawbacks. Mining it scars the landscape, and burning it endangers the planet by pouring climate-changing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. 40% of the CO2 pumped into the air comes from burning coal. At 1 PM, I was A number Kelly and other co-op members this are happy to bring down. Was like in what I've done so far this year is equivalent to planting 33 trees. You see that? Yes, I do. I've reduced my carbon footprint by 3,017 pounds. 
Now, I don't know exactly what that means, but I feel good about it. There's a mountaintop in West Virginia that's building uh, a monument it owes to me. you. Yeah, that's, that's... So why is solar power providing less than 1% of U.S. electricity? No surprise here. Money. Technology continues to cut the price of materials dramatically. But in the U.S., solar is still three times more expensive than coal. It costs about $20,000 to install even a small rooftop array. But things are changing. Government tax breaks are bringing solar within range of the middle class. Most arrays will now pay for themselves in five to ten years and keep on generating power for 30. But getting away from coal is never going to be easy. The whole system in the United States is set up for a different kind of energy right now, a different kind of delivery. And it's really, there's no silver bullet. It's a gradual chipping away. You need a new regulation here, you need a new kind of machine there. And it's that constant being on top of how to make the implementation easier, more practical, cheaper. Breaking with the norm takes courage, yeah, a willingness to gamble. But with energy, standing still may be the riskiest play of all. Especially when other countries are zooming ahead of the U.S. It's always tough to make a decision when you just can't be sure of the consequences. Energy choices often involve laying out money in advance. I mean, essentially betting on some future benefit delivered down the line. The key players at the energy table, big business, government, banks lay out billions of dollars every year hoping for a payoff the power game is changing in 2009 for the first time the amount of money laid down on renewable energy investments was more than the cash funneled into fossil fuels and some countries are betting the house that this trend will continue they believe that renewable energy is not only a good way to save the planet, it's also a great way to create new jobs. Take the solar power industry. Making and installing solar energy systems employs over 750,000 workers globally. One of the world's high-tech hubs for solar panel research is still in the US. Silicon Valley, California. These days, the money and the silicon that greased the internet boom is migrating towards clean energy products. Applied Materials, the world's largest supplier of machines that make computer chips, now leads the world in a growing new market. Machines that make solar panels. But most of their billion dollar business is overseas. So Mike, what are we seeing out here? Well, what we're seeing is an array of solar cells. Uh, CEO Mike Splinter worries that other countries are beating the U.S. to a valuable new market. 75% of the solar panel making machines go to Chinese companies. Uh, they helped make uh, five years ago. Uh, China made about 5% of the solar panels. Uh, this year they'll make almost 50%. Uh, so of all the global solar panels on the planet? Yes. Half of them are going to be made in China? Yes. And that switchover just happened in the last few years. So does that really worry you? Uh, as an American, it certainly worries me. Uh, I think this is the biggest opportunity, the biggest market that we're going to see in this century. And that creates a huge opportunity for jobs to be created. If all those jobs go someplace else, we're just trading our energy dependence uh, from Saudi Arabia and the Middle East to uh, 
China or other countries that are going to really make the investment to produce renewable energy. China is pumping $34 billion a year into clean technologies, nearly double what the U.S. commits. At the very top level, China has undergone a shift in the way they think about environment. Peggy Liu heads a think tank studying China's energy policies. In the last three years, we have really undergone somewhat of a green revolution in terms of attitude, in terms of mentality. That green revolution is creating a lot of jobs, funded by government money. And when it comes to rolling out green energy goods, China's ambitions are clear. They want to lead the market in products needed to save the planet. Things like vacuum tubes that use solar power to heat water. 95% of all solar thermal tubes are made in China. About a third of them will be shipped around the world. But most will stay right here, becoming part of China's own push to use renewable energy at home. These water heaters are going up in the city of Duzhou, nearly 200 miles south of Beijing. Dijon is a city undergoing a complete transformation. From sleepy outpost to new solar city. A living showcase for the country's determination to go green. In China, the industry is being led by government policy from up above. So it's really China's central government that has said this is a priority. We must do this. The government spent $10 million installing solar-powered streetlights in Dezhou. Over 80% of the buildings in town have solar water heaters. And some 800,000 workers in the area, one in three, have jobs in the solar industry. Unlike the United States, China has set a national goal for itself. By 2020, it wants to double its renewable energy using wind, solar, and geothermal power for 15% of the country's needs. Why the rush? In the past 25 years, Chinese energy consumption has quadrupled. Satisfying the growing needs of 1.3 billion people and avoiding the social upheaval an energy crisis could bring means pulling power from any and all sources. The Chinese government is very incented to go green. And they're talking about energy as the sort of fundamental element for harmonious society. We don't want people fighting over, is my factory going to get energy so that I can produce sweaters on a Friday? Or am I going to be able to get enough oil so that I can drive from one city to another to deliver my food. And what this means is we don't want to have riots in the streets. In the race to free the world from its addiction to oil, no breakthrough has proven more difficult to achieve than the invention of an affordable and practical electric car. It's a global contest, a kind of engineering Olympics. China's entry, the BYD, short for Build Your Dream. Germany's got the BMW Mini E. Nissan in Japan is sprouting the leaf. And Big Auto Detroit is muscling in with the Chevy Volt and the Ford Focus, all within months of each other. The big corporations are getting a run for their money from smaller, more flexible innovators determined to put their products on the road. This car will meet... Kevin Zinger is an entrepreneur who's teaming up with China to produce his own American electric car. It charges with a simple 220 household plug. Zinger's got one parked in his Los Angeles driveway. This is it, huh? This is the Coda sedan that's going to be coming out in California. 
uh, at the end of this year. Wow, it even has a new cough smell, huh? Absolutely. <laughs> it just doesn't have the gasoline bill. Here we go. Zinger believes past electric cars have been too exotic. Playthings for the rich and famous. His dream is to make Coda the first perfectly ordinary electric car. Saving his customers greenback dollars as they're reducing greenhouse gases. No look at me features here. He has designed the Coda to look like a run-of-the-mill sedan capable of merging quietly onto the American roadways. You know, we're here on a free wind. No one's looking at us. People are passing us, people are behind us. That's kind of, you really forget that you're an electric car. But for this car, there's really no noticeable difference at all with a, a comparable internal combustion engine car, except for the fact that it's quieter and quicker. No matter what the style, an electric car must answer one immediate question. How far will it go on a single charge? American drivers average 33 miles a day. But the Coda promises to deliver 100 miles worry-free. That makes one component key to success. So what's the secret to an electric car? It's all about the battery. The battery is the key enabling technology. The, mad the battery, safe, reliable, affordable battery system, equals safe, reliable, affordable, all-electric car. That's the fundamental equation. This is where all the... For his exclusive battery design, Zinger signed up a team of engineers based in a California lab. And we can get to look under one they came up with a 900-pound battery pack bolted beneath the floor of the car. Uh, I'm really proud of what we've Phil Gao is the chief engineer on the project. The kind of thermal so how many batteries are on this thing? It's one battery made up of 728 cells. It looks nothing like a car battery. It, it is nothing like a car battery. It's its own unique thing. In common English, it's enough to push a car the size of a Coda for 100 miles, and it's got uh, more than enough power to handle all 133 horsepower. Where are these batteries made? Right now, they're made in China. Battery manufacturing is another growing energy business where the Chinese are jumping out in front of the rest of the world. This is the Lishan Battery Factory in northern China, where they're making batteries in a joint venture for the Coda car. Lishan is the leading maker of small lithium batteries for American companies like Apple, Samsung, and Motorola. You may already have one of their batteries in your cell phone. So why China? China's invested a huge amount in uh, building batteries and building plants to build batteries. And when we said we needed to build this battery for this car, they put up a 500,000 square foot plant, custom set up, state of the art, to build these batteries for us. Because of jobs? Because of jobs and because they see that that's the future. So why can't we do it here? I mean, this doesn't seem like a that difficult thing to do. We're working on doing it here. We're, we're, uh, we're looking into doing that at the same time. But to begin with, we have to start in China because all, they've already made that commitment and already uh, built the plant to be able to build these batteries. China's eagerness to encourage new technology makes this American car possible. For an American entrepreneur, yeah. teaming up with China and other international partners is really the only way to create a competitive car without spending hundreds of millions, if not a billion dollars or more, of capital. And that's a revolution. It's too early to tell if Zinger's electric sedan will catch on. But by plugging into China's energy revolution, He's giving himself a fighting chance and showing how many roads to the future run through China. Still, other alternatives to oil are being cooked up much closer to home. Jimmy Martin is a man in the middle of his own personal energy crisis. His fleet of 18-wheelers runs up the East Coast from Florida to Maine. 
and every six miles, his trucks burn a gallon of diesel fuel. When my daddy started in the trucking business in 1972, we were paying 25 cents a gallon for fuel. So fuel was not a big issue. Now when we're almost at $3 a gallon, and some places you are over $3 a gallon, fuel is your most expense. Despite the rising price of oil, trucks continue to dominate the freight industry. In the U.S., 80% of all the energy spent on moving goods is burned by trucks. Lately, Jimmy has made a point of filling his tanks at a small truck stop in Martinsville, Virginia. He likes the fact that their diesel fuel is part vegetable oil. I started using it before I even knew I was using it, to be honest. Uh, I never paid no attention to the sign at the bottom of the tank. But then I got to noticing my trucks were running smoother. I was getting better fuel mileage. It seemed to be running a little cleaner. So I'm really amazed with it, Dave. How about your engine? Have you seen any difference in the... Dean Price, the owner of the Red Birch Truck Stop, believes that biofuels hold the key to the future. I really... My trucks don't really use any oil. He was first inspired by an energy blast of a different kind. Hurricane Katrina. Katrina swept through the Gulf in the summer of 2005 with the force of an atomic bomb, ripping right through the heart of U.S. oil fields in the Gulf of Mexico. The storm damaged or destroyed 30 oil platforms, disrupting a quarter of all U.S. oil production and sent an economic shockwave across the entire nation. Dean Price remembers it well. It was August the 30th of 2005. It hit on a Monday. By Friday, this truck stop had run out of fuel. So it was sort of my come to Jesus moment when I sort of realized how dependent not only my business, but this country was on foreign oil. Katrina stopped the flow of much of our foreign oil too. Blocked by the ravaged refineries and ports in the Gulf. And it, it, it scared me. But not only did it scare me, it, it angered me. And I started thinking, what could I do as a, as a businessman, as an entrepreneur, um, as an American, what could I do to make this truck stop energy independent? So what we set out to do is we built a biodiesel plant here next to the truck stop. The Red Birch refinery produces about 2,000 gallons of biofuel a day. Dean and his partners are staking their careers and their financial futures on the energy contained inside millions of tiny canola seeds. The biofuel process is pretty low tech. Squeeze out the oil, save the high protein husks to sell as animal feed, filter out the impurities, mix with the same chemicals found in some antifreeze and drain cleaners, and serve, either straight or combined with diesel. For Dean Price, the benefits go far beyond the fuel. If you think about big oil, they're not really in the oil business per se. They're in the infrastructure business. They get it from A to B, through pipelines, through barges, through tankers. And what they do is they bring it to a central point, and then through the pipelines, they distribute it out to the retailers into your vehicle. Biofuels works the very opposite. The crops are already decentralized. The majority of the diesel in this country is consumed on the interstates. Just so happens that our interstates run through the heartland of America, farms. We contracted with area farmers to grow a crop called canola. Glen Rhodes is one of 50 local farmers benefiting from Dean Price's biofuel business. It's a canola flower. The flowers bloom on these little stems and then a seed pod forms. That's, that's what we're after, is the seed in the, in the plant. Burning fuel from living plants nets no carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. The amount of CO2 released using biofuels is just the same amount the plants absorbed while growing. Some worry that setting aside farmland to grow the fuel for our cars and trucks will make our food more scarce and expensive. But canola biofuels compete less with food crops than corn-based products like ethanol. Glenn plants his canola in the winter and rotates it with wheat. 
He runs his own equipment on biodiesel. And he's grateful for the extra income provided by the energy crop. I don't think that, that biofuels will necessarily save every farm, but it's a tool that will help those who want to do it reduce their costs. It'll make farming more viable for more people that want to do it. If the drip drip of oil in Dean Price's shed represents the future, it seems like it has a long way to go. Biofuels make up barely 5% of our energy needs, even when you count corn ethanol. And there's some powerful companies protecting their turf. We're competing against Exxon. We're competing against Shell, ADM, and Cargill. These are some of the biggest names in the world as far as business goes. And here's Red Birch Energy, a little podunk biodiesel manufacturing outfit that can compete with them. I hope he does real good at it because if he can go at it, maybe some of these other truck stops will get the hint that they'll start doing it because biodiesel is kind of a hard thing to find. But Dean feels if he can hang on, the rest of the world will eventually come around. Day 2010. Yeah, you, the Secretary of the Navy, Ray Mabus, introduces the world to a pet project. A battle-ready FA-18 Super Hornet, flying on a 50-50 mix of petroleum and biojet fuel. They call the plane the Green Hornet. It went at Mach 1.2 over the speed of sound. It performed very well. The plane didn't notice the difference. Mabus is putting together an entire carrier strike group. The aircraft carrier, submarine, supporting ships, helicopters, and FA-18 jet fighters, capable of running on alternative energy by 2016. By 2020, Mabus wants half the Navy's energy to come from alternative and renewable sources. But meeting his goal of 16 million barrels of biofuel would mean a 400,000% increase in its current consumption. Mabus is confident that the Navy will make the switch, cultivating everything from oilseed crops to algae, developing homegrown fuels the whole country can one day use. What we bring to the table is the demand. We use a lot of fuel. We can help small business, we can help agriculture, we can help in terms of energy independence for this entire country and not just for our military. Dean Price is certainly hoping Mabus's prediction comes true and biofuels finally enter the energy mainstream. A hundred years from now, when those fellows over there in the desert are out of oil, our children and our grandchildren will still have oil and will be, it is renewable. It will come back year after year after year. The choices we make about energy today will shape our future in ways both big and small. Right now, we are making decisions about how we use energy that will determine the quality of our lives, the security of our country, and the health of our planet. There may be no single answer to all our needs, but by conserving what we have, creating new resources, and changing the way we think about power, it can work. It's an adventure unlike any other in history, involving the entire world. And it comes at a time when we have the opportunity and knowledge to determine how we power our future.